processing. Now, tonight I want to talk particularly about the human makeup of spirit, soul, and body. This is so very important. This will give you understanding. It will give you discernment of things in the spirit realm. Just, I, I, I can't emphasize how important this understanding has been to me and to Sue in our own lives. And, um, and, and uh, Charles and Delilah Hicks, whom I will be with this weekend, if you're in the Paris, Texas area, Northeast Texas, Southeast Oklahoma, come and join us. I know we have talked about this a lot, how understanding, especially the difference between soul and spirit, is so important in discern, discerning the spirits in this hour and testing the spirits and so on. I want to start, though, by talking about how that you are more than a physical body. The real you is not a physical body. You have a physical body, the material, physical part, but there is another part of you that is non-physical. You have an I. We have an existence apart from our physical body. I'll say that again. We have an existence apart from our physical body. Hey, look who's here. Hey, look who's here. <laughs> Hey, come in. We got some folks coming in here. We're pausing. So, hey, so glad y'all came tonight. Good to see you, Vince. And who's these other people here? <laughs> hey, we're glad you all are here, too. <laughs> we, um, spirit, soul, and body. We're talking about spirit, soul, and body tonight. And I was just emphasizing you and I, we have an existence apart from our physical body. When you see me, there's more to me than what you see looking at me, my face, my being. I'm looking at Madison. There's more to Madison than just what I see there. Because we all have an existence apart from our physical being. And that existence is actually the real you, the real me. Because when you or I die, and our body is laid in the grave, you do not cease to exist. Now I want to quote from some scriptures, but I'll share a little story. Some of you have heard this in the past. But I, I have a cousin, uh, southeast Oklahoma. She's, I think she's a few years younger than me. But I'll never forget when Sue and I lived in Canada, and this has been a, probably 40 years ago, uh, I got a call from... Uh, down in this part of the country and asking me to pray for her that she had been in a very serious car accident. Her name is Carolyn and she was 22 years old at the time and uh, she was transported to Dallas and I later did call her there in the hospital and talk to her and pray with her. But then when we came down for a visit we stopped by to see her and she told us this amazing story about being separated from her body, dying in a car accident and being separated from her body. She said that um, she was going home from teaching school. She was a school teacher in Grant, Oklahoma. And they had just built a new four lane uh, to Tulsa, Oklahoma, Henrietta, Oklahoma, down to Hugo, Oklahoma. And there was a drunk man, he was on the See, and I could hear everything happening. I could see cars stopping and people getting out. And, uh, and I could hear what they were saying. And so people came over and they were looking at, at me. And, um, and she said, everything was just as real outside of my body as it was when I was in my body. She said, the only difference was I could not talk to or communicate to anybody there in their physical bodies. Because you see, our body is our earth suit. <laughs> we need our body to communicate here on earth. 
And she had lost her earth suit and she couldn't communicate with any of the people. But she said everything was just as real and I could hear people talking. And she said, I could see myself lying there in my wrecked car with blood running out the side of my mouth. And she said, uh, she said while I was there up above in that state, she said, uh, one of my husband's uncles who had died six months before this, so he's in this state also. She said, he came up to me and he said, it's time to go. And she said, in one sense, I didn't want to go back because it was a wonderful, glorious feeling there in that state outside of my body. She said, but I knew everything. She said, I knew that I had a husband and I had two small children. And I said to him, no, I don't want to go yet. I want to go back to my husband and my children. And she said, right after that, a pastor, and his name will probably come to my mind, he pastored the Assembly of God Church in Hugo, Oklahoma. His name was Stanley, last name was Stanley. She said he stopped and, um, and got out, was talking to people, and she heard somebody say to him, there's a girl over in that car talking about her, but don't go over there, she's dead. He said, but he came over anyway. And she said, I watched him take my hand and begin to pray. And she said, when he took my hand and began to pray, I came back down from where I was and I entered into my body through the top of my head. <laughs> and I was back alive and on this earth. Well, she, the last time I talked to her, she was still alive today. But you know one thing she said to me? She said, I, I, I'm, I've, she said, I am no longer afraid of death. And you know, we as believers do not have to be afraid of dying. We do not have to be afraid of death. And we shouldn't be. And when you overcome the fear of death, you can overcome any other fear. There is nothing that can stop you. I love a little story <laughs> I heard R.W. Schambach tell many years ago, I heard him tell this. And I think this was probably back in, I'm going to guess probably in the 1970s, he was preaching somewhere in Alabama. And of course, it was a very interracial revival meeting under his tent and everything. And he said his, his phone rang in his hotel one day, and uh, he said he answered it and said, uh, the voice on the other end said, is this the preacher? <laughs> he said, yep. He said, uh, well, this is the Ku Klux Klan and we don't like what you're doing here. And if, and if you don't close down this meeting, you're, we're going to kill you. And uh, Schembach said, he said, well, I got news for you. He said, what's that? He said, you can't kill me. And the voice on the other end said, why not? He said, I'm already dead. He hung up. <laughs> My friends, when you overcome the fear of death, you cannot be intimidated. I'll say that again. When you overcome the fear of death, you cannot be intimidated. Paul said one time, listen to this. This is in uh, Philippians 1. I believe it's verse 20, 123. He says, for I am hard pressed between two. two. Two two ways he could go. Whether to stay or to go. He said, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Paul says, hey, I would like to depart. I'd just like to leave now. I'd like to, this old body to die and be put in a grave or a tomb somewhere. And I would go and be with Christ. See, he knew he had an existence apart from his physical body. His physical body was not the real Paul. And your physical body is not the real you. Even though you spend so much time on your body trying to make it look good, maybe we should spend a little more time on our inner man, our inner person, working on our inner person. <laughs> because that's the real you. You're on the ball too much. 
<laughs> For I am hard pressed, Paul says, between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Paul knew he had an existence apart from his physical uh, being on this earth, and, when, and to depart was far better. But he said, nevertheless, I know that you folks still need me here in this body, so I've decided I'm going to stay on just for your benefit a little while longer. You remember Jesus on the cross, the two thieves. Wow. What a, what a story. Two thieves. And one of them railed at him. If you're the Messiah, come down off the cross and save us. The other one had a humble and repentant heart. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied and said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, Today, you will be with me in paradise. Paradise being that place where the departed spirits of the godly went. And so, we have a real existence. Our friend Valerie Owen just wrote a book on the hills because she wanted, she wa she wanted uh, the younger generation to know that there, there is a real existence outside of this body and heaven is real and hell is real. You know, in the story, I was reading this today and I decided to read it tonight. And you know the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And one thing that the, the, rich, the story of rich, the rich man and Lazarus illustrates is that there is an existence outside of this physical body. Someone say, well, well that's just a parable. Yes, yeah, but a parable is, is given to communicate real truth. And by the way, most Bible scholars would say, and I would say this is not a parable because real names are used in the story. And Jesus says, a certain rich man. And he, and he names the beggar named Lazarus. And, and the, the two different, these two different individuals, their lives were very different here on earth. One lived in luxury. The other one was a beggar covered with sores who lived at the rich man's gate and who just hoped to eat some of the crumbs that fell from the table. He was covered with sores and the, the dogs would come and lick his open sores, the Bible says. What a contrast. But then everything shifts when they died. And their state in the next world, totally different. My friends, man, are people ever going to be surprised? Because the existence in the next world is not going to look like it is here. In the next world, the rich man was the beggar. And he lifted up his eyes in hell and he saw Abraham and Lazarus there. It says at his side. In his bosom means at his side. And he said, uh, Father Abraham, send Lazarus. And now he's pleading. He had no mercy on Lazarus when he was here on earth, but now he's pleading with Lazarus. With, 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 Abraham to send Lazarus and tip his finger in, in water to cool my tongue. I'm tormented in this flame. And of course, Abraham said, well, that, that, that can't happen. And then the rich man said, I'm going to read it here, please, Father Abraham, send him to my father's home. And I'm reading from, from the New Living Translation because it just makes it so vivid. He says, please send Lazarus to my father's home, for I have five brothers and I want him to warn them about this place of torment so they won't have to come here when they die. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Moses and the prophets refers to the scriptures. Your brothers can read their writings anytime they want to. The rich man replied, no, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, they will turn from their sins. 
But Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, if they won't listen to the scriptures, they won't listen even if someone rises from the dead. But the, the part that stood out to me was talking about we have an existence outside of the, our bodies where he said, send Lazarus back to earth. For I have five brothers and I want him to warn them about this place of torment so that they won't have to come here when they die. You see, when we die, we go someplace apart from that, from that graveyard. We still, we continue to have an existence. And that existence is the real you that non-physical, spiritual, non-material part of you which consists of your soul and your spirit. Lord, we thank you that as the old timers used to say, there's a, I think they would say, it, there's a, a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And there's still, it's, that's still the truth. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And Lord, may we have a new passion and a new urgency in our witness, in our preaching, in our teaching in this hour, oh God, to, commun to communicate your truth and to, uh, and to declare, oh God, the reality of eternity and heaven and hell and of Jesus and his death on the cross. And, and your salvation, thank you for it, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Now, if you have your manual, I'm going to look at the manual and I'm going to look at some of this uh, uh, definitions, particularly of the spirit and the soul. Because you see, the non-material part of us that departs when we die is both our spirit and our soul. Now, it's very important to understand, to distinguish between the two because that will give us understanding and discernment of spiritual manifestations, of people's prophecies, of, you know, any kind of manifestations that take place, it will help us to understand and discern its source. So, I am looking here on page 49 in the manual, and, uh, and Sue has a diagram that I have found helpful. Spirit, soul, and body. You see it there on the screen. And it's, as you see, it's three circles, the inner circle representing the spirit. The spirit is that innermost part of us. I like that other one better, Sue. It, it, uh, it's better for what I'm going to describe here. Your spirit is that innermost part of your being. The spirit gives us awareness of God and the spirit realm. Um, for the, the believer, when you're born again, it is your spirit that is made new, is regenerated by the, by the Holy Spirit. And it is in our new reborn spirit is where the Holy Spirit comes to dwell. Sometimes it's called the heart. It's the center of our being. Jesus said one time, out of your, the King James says belly, literally out of your heart, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Now, some of you can testify to this. I have experienced, I have felt those rivers of living water rising up on the inside of me and flowing out. Wow. I will never forget Sue and I praying with a woman, uh, a very wealthy woman, had, had, uh, was married to a billionaire. And uh, they'd just gone through a divorce after 20 years of marriage. And God providentially brought us across her path. I won't go into the detailed story. But I'll just say this. As we were driving out to meet with her in her home, I was driving. Sue was sitting in the passenger seat and was driving out. She just began to, come, to gently, she began to pray in tongues. And I could tell it wasn't from here up. You know, sometimes we pray in tongues from here up. But I like it when we pray from, from our innermost being, when it rises up by the Spirit of God. And I could tell that Sue, she was interceding. It was rising up out of the Spirit. And uh, I had a sense of what she was praying about. And I said, what are you praying about? She said, I feel like I'm praying for Joan. I said, yes, that's what I sense you're praying about too. So we got there. We got to this woman's home and her sister-in-law, who was a believer, a Wesleyan Christian, was there. And, um, and, and we had never see, we had met this other woman once before that owned the house. 
But her sister-in-law, who was also married to one of these billionaire brothers, uh, found out we were believers. She was a Christian, but the other woman who owned the house wasn't. And uh, she said, oh, I would like for us to pray for Joan because she was about to leave. And we said, uh, yes, we'd like to pray for her. And Sue was still feeling the spirit rising up from her innermost being. But she didn't know how these people would receive that. And, she, I, and I still remember her saying this. She said, yes, we want to pray, but it's going to come out in tongues. And they said, I said, oh, that's okay. And so Sue, now this time she, she just, it was, I guess it had gotten pent up and she just burst forth, you know, Kila <laughs> and we're sitting on the back veranda <laughs> of their porch. My friends, the Holy Spirit has not confined himself to church services. <laughs> God has not confined himself to buildings with steeples on them. <laughs> you are the church of the living God. You bear his spirit wherever you go. Oh, let's take church outside the building. And so I looked over at this woman who owned the house who was not a Christian. Who, who, she was a formal Presbyterian, went to church at Easter and Christmas. Her eyes were big as saucers and I knew she was wondering what is going on here. And so I knew I needed to be simple as possible. And so I said, that's God speaking. She said, well, what is he saying? Well, lo and behold, God had given me the interpretation. So I took her by the hand and I began to speak what God had given me as the interpretation to the tongues that Sue had spoken. And as I did, I noticed the tears begin to roll down her cheek. And, and, uh, and I said to her, I said, would you like, I said, you know, God, God loves you and he wants you to turn your life over to him and put your life in his hands. I said, would you be willing to pray a prayer committing your life to Jesus? She said, yes. And so we joined hands and we prayed and she committed her life to Jesus Christ. I just led her in a simple prayer. When, we, when the prayer ended, man, the presence of God was so thick and so manifest, I have never since the presence of God any more intense than I did sitting there with Sue and these two women on her back veranda. And I knew, I knew that I knew that God wanted to baptize this woman in the Holy Spirit. I knew she didn't know a thing about it, in the, knew a thing about it. I wasn't sure how her Wesleyan sister-in-law would, would, would uh, 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 respond to it, but I knew that God wanted to do it and I knew that I had it to act then while the Holy Spirit was moving, while the Holy Spirit was manifesting. So I said to her, I said, I said, Jonah, after people accepted Jesus into their life, and, and I kept saying in the Bible, because I knew she did respect the Bible, I said, in the Bible, it was common for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Would you like to be filled with the Holy Spirit? She said, yes. And I said, well, in the Bible, when people were filled with the Holy Spirit, one way it happened was somebody laid hands on them and prayed. I said, would you be willing for us to lay hands on you and pray? She said, that would be fine. Now I'm talking about our spirit, that innermost part of our being, especially as Christians. If you're not a Christian, you're spiritually dead. Your spirit is dead. It needs to be regenerated and made alive and born again by the Spirit of God. And this woman had just been born again. But then God wanted to come her, into her in a, in, a, in a more distinct and powerful way. The Holy Spirit was already there at working, regenerating her, but now he wanted to empower her in a new way to be his witness. Uh, I have this in a scripture. I believe it's right. Oh, here, here it is right here. Ezekiel. This is a prophetic statement about the new birth and the filling of the Spirit, Ezekiel tw chapter 26, verses 26 and 27. And he's, God said through Ezekiel, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I'm going to give you a new spirit. My friends, oh, may God, oh, how the world, how people need that new spirit from God, that new spirit from heaven. It will change everything. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. Turning over a new leaf won't do it. A new year's resolution is not enough. Oh, we need that new spirit from heaven. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take out the heart of stone 
out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. In other words, a, a heart that is soft and pliable. And after I give you a new heart and a new spirit, here's what I'll do, God says. I will put my spirit within you. After I give you a new spirit, I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And so I said to this woman, one more thing, I said, in the Bible, when people were filled with the Holy Spirit, it was not uncommon for them to speak in a language they had never spoken before. I said, so uh, uh, when we pray, if you feel like speaking in a language that you've never spoken before, please feel free to do it. She said, okay. Yeah, we, we learned later that she, in the natural, spoke five different languages. So Sue and I laid our hands on her. I noticed her Wesleyan sister-in-law came over and laid her hands on her. And we began to pray. And oh, I could see the power of God on this woman. Uh, and, 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 and there were certain things happening. Her eyelids were, were fluttering. Her lips were quivering. Her eyelids were fluttering. And you could just see the power of God upon her. And the power of God had come into her. But, but there wasn't the release that I knew was there available for her. So we stopped praying and I said to her, what are you experiencing? You know, it's okay to talk about and even sometimes when we're praying for people to ask them what they're experiencing. And here's what she said. This was so interesting. She said, well, she said there was something. She put her, her hand like this. She said there was something right here. And she said it came up and it got right here and it stopped. I knew what that was. The Holy Spirit had come in. And now he was wanting to flow out. And always remember, my friends, you are not the Dead Sea spiritually. The Holy Spirit does not come in to stop. You know, the, you know why the, it's called the Dead Sea? There's no life in it? Because the Jordan River flows in and it stops. There's no outlet. There's no outflow. It just It stops. There's no life there. The Holy Spirit always comes in for the purpose of then flowing out. God makes us a channel, a conduit of His presence, of His gifts, of His power. And so I said to her, I said, you know, I said, that's the Holy Spirit. He has come in. And I said, He's wanting now to flow out. And I said, now we're going to pray again. And I said, when you feel that coming up like that and gets up to here, I said, just open your mouth and let it come on out. <laughs> We laid our hands on her and started to pray. It was like a volcano erupted. This woman, she broke forth, speaking in tongues, shouting praises to God and laughing hilariously. This is like about 1977. And, uh, and then this is what is amazing. Her Wesleyan sister-in-law had been witnessing to her for years, trying to talk to her about Jesus without any success. She's, she's shouting praises to God in other tongues. The tears are flowing and she's shouting praises to God. And suddenly she turns to her Wesleyan sister-in-law and lays her hands on her and prays over her in other tongues. <laughs> it was incredible. And when finally things kind of settled down, her Wesleyan sister-in-law looked at her in amazement and said, Joan, you are going like an old Pentecostal. <laughs> oh, my friends, amazing things God has for us. Open up your heart. Let the Spirit flow. And so that, that innermost part of you, our spirit, it's where, the, it, it's, it's where we're made new when we put our faith in Jesus. Our spirit, we get a new spirit, what we call regeneration. Then the Holy Spirit, He comes in. And this is what Jesus said, out of your innermost being, out of your heart will flow rivers. That woman, she experienced those rivers flowing forth by the Holy Spirit. And that's where the Holy Spirit dwells in our innermost being. Now, He doesn't dwell in our soul. Doesn't dwell in our physical body. He dwells, yes, our body is the temple 
the naos of the Holy Spirit. But, but, but He dwells in their innermost part of our being, and when He manifests and flows out, we, we will sense His presence in, in our soul, in our emotions, and even sometimes physically. So our spirit gives us awareness of the spirit realm and of God. Now our soul, let's move on to it, consists of our mind, our will, our emotions, our thinking me mechanisms, our imaginations, our feelings, our emotions. Romans 12, 2. The, the Greek word for soul is suke, from which we get psyche, psychological, and so on. There are many passages that tell us how that our soul has to be renewed. Romans 12, 2, which was written to believers. Paul said to them that you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, when you were born again, although your soul may have been impacted by, you know, to, everybody's experience is not the same, but your soul may have been impacted by what happened in your spirit. But your, your soul was not transformed. Your soul was not changed. Your soul, your mind will have to be renewed. And what do we mean renewed? Your, your, you have to change your stinking thinking, as somebody said. You have to get a checkup from the neck up. And you have to, to renew your mind in God's Word so that your thinking is in line with your renewed spirit and the Holy Spirit who is dwelling in your innermost being. And as your mind is renewed in the Word of God, your soul becomes more aligned with your spirit and the Holy Spirit who is dwelling in you. One way to know if our mind is really renewed is our immediate response to situations. I remember many years ago in the early days of our marriage, Sue and I had a 1975 Ford Pinto in St. John, New Brunswick. And um, uh, we crossed, I crossed sometimes, a lot of time by myself, but sometimes together we crossed the, um, uh, the bridge, the Harbor Bridge where the St. John River ran into the Bay of Fundy. And you either had to put a quarter in the, in the thing or a toll, uh, what do you call it, a toll coin, token, a token. And uh, somehow the window handle on the driver's side broke off of this Ford Pinto. And so it just had a little stub and it was very hard to roll the window up and down. So when I would drive across, I didn't try to roll up and down that window. It was too hard with that little uh, stub of a, a window handle. I would open the door and throw in the quarter or throw in the, the token. Well, we finally got another vehicle. And I come across the Harbor Bridge. I'm in a new car with power windows. But what do I do when I drive up to the toll booth? I open the door and throw it in. <laughs> Because my mind has not yet been renewed to the change <laughs> that has happened. <laughs> oh, my friends, how our minds need to be renewed according to the wonderful thing that has happened down in our innermost being by the Spirit of God. That's why Paul said, be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you can prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Passages such as Joshua 1.8 and Psalms 1, 1 through 3 tell us that success comes through the person whose thinking has been renewed by the Word of God. Joshua 1.8, I'm not turning over there, but I think this is what it says. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. But you shall meditate therein day and night. Wow, isn't that something? Think about it a couple of times a day. Read, read, read a verse before I go to bed at night. No, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. But you shall meditate, think in it day and night. And then you will make that you, that you may prosper. 
and have good, good success in all that you do. So shall your way, you'll make your way prosperous and have good success. How? By not letting the word of God depart from your mouth and thinking about it, meditating on it day and night, renewing your mind, renewing your thinking, and your mind becomes aligned with your new spirit and the Holy Spirit who is living on the inside of you. That's what the word transform means. The Greek word is metamorphi, metamorphosis. Uh, in, in other words, there, there is an actual change of your being. It, it, uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Sue. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformed is a Greek word metamorphi from which we get metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is what happens when an ugly green caterpillar goes into a cocoon and goes into, I guess, hibernation, but then he goes through a great struggle and he breaks out of the cocoon and he's a beautiful butterfly. Now think about this. He's not a ugly green caterpillar with a butterfly suit on. No, he has been, his essence, his being, <laughs> has been actually transformed hallelujah Paul said you will be metamorphosized you've got a new spirit and the Holy Spirit has come in but as you renew your mind you will be metamorphosized you will be changed into something you're not I preached at a church in the, uh, Hugo Oklahoma not too long ago not too far from where I grew up in fact the the pastor, he's a little bit younger than me, Keith and Brown, uh, he grew up in the church my dad pastored. And uh, this woman who was in the church there, uh, and she's known me since back when I was a teenager, and she could hardly believe that it was me. <laughs> and she told me afterwards that she once said to my, my dad, who was the pastor, said, do you think Eddie will ever go into ministry? And my dad said, no, not Eddie. He said, Pete might. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I got metamorphosized. Oh, well, because as a kid, I was just so backward and shy, and uh, I never talked in public or anything. Uh, it was hard for me, uh, even after I got born again, it's hard for me to even put my hand up and praise to God in a service. <laughs> And now I have a hard time stopping because I've been metamorphosized. <laughs> oh, how we need to renew our minds in God's holy word. Lord, we thank you for the power of the word of God. The word of God is able to change you. The, 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 the word of God is able to transform you and metamorphosize you and change you and make you something that you're not right now. Make you all that God called you to be and created you to be. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah for the power of His Word. Glory to your name. Glory to your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. Oh, we bless your holy name, Lord. And you know what? There's a passage. I didn't know I was going to get to this this quick, but I just feel to go ahead and share this part. There's a passage over in... 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 25, I want to read in relation to this. Now, we're talking about the soul renewing our minds. Paul says, Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord. Yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. Now, what Paul's talking about here, pagan societies were just so just so immoral and so on that it seems that in the early Christians in the first century, there were people in reaction to the is, they, they, they formed these, these groups that they were going to maintain their sexual purity and so on. And this seems to be what Paul is referring to. There in uh, Corinth, which was, <laughs> which was uh, one biblical scholar said that uh, Corinth was... Las Vegas, San Francisco, and he, he named all the, the most wicked cities he could think of, said they were, he, it was all of these rolled into one. And uh, 
But he said, so Paul is probably addressing a group that has decided that in reaction to the cultural mores of that city that they're going to live sexually pure lives. And so Paul says, now concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord. Yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. I give judgment. I'm going to give you my opinion. Paul says, I don't have any commandment from the Lord about this, what you people are doing there, but I'm going to give you my opinion, give you my judgment. What's interesting is, Paul's mind had been so renewed in a godly way of thinking that his opinion was so close to the mind and heart of God that it became enshrined and included in the canon of Scripture. And I remember, <laughs> I remember getting an email from somebody and they were given a prophecy and like every, like it seemed like every other sentence was, Thus saith the Lord Almighty, thus saith Almighty God, thus saith the Lord of hosts. And I'm reading through all of these and I was thinking then, Paul's letters which we consider to be at the highest level of inspiration. He never interspersed it with us saith the Lord, I say unto thee, and so on. He just wrote. And then here, he said, I don't have any commandment from the Lord. I'm going to give you my opinion. But Paul's mind had become so renewed that his opinion became enshrined in the Holy Scriptures. Oh, may our minds be so renewed in God's Word. May our hearts become, be so, become so transformed and conformed to His heart and mind that even our opinions and our judgments will be so close to the heart and mind of God. But you see, because that hasn't happened, and there are people who have experienced being born again, and they've been even had the infilling of the Holy Spirit, but their minds are not renewed. But they want to flow. They want to flow in, in the prophetic. They want to flow in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And often they do this out of a soul that has not been uh, developed and has grown like the individual that prophesied to me, this was many years ago, I was in Bible school, <laughs> who prophesied to me that, uh, that I didn't have to worry about my little brother anymore, that God had revealed to him, God had just given him a revelation, thus saith the Lord, your little brother will be saved. <laughs> there was only one problem, I didn't have a little brother. <laughs> I felt embarrassed for this person. <laughs> And I was just going to leave it alone. I didn't even say anything. But then he, he pressed it and wanted to know about my little brother. So I had to tell him, I don't have a little brother. And then he was really embarrassed. <laughs> he was not a false prophet. He was just a person <laughs> who had never learned to distinguish between his soul and his spirit. And, and for some reason, he, you know, I, I had met him, and, but he didn't know anything about me or anything. But somewhere in his minds, in his own thinkings and imaginations, he had these thoughts, and he thought they were from the Spirit of God. But no, they had originated somewhere in the realm, in his own soul, in his own thinking. I remember in Bible school, my first year there, there was a, a, a fellow, his name was Amel. I was first year, Amel was the second year. And I remember Amel telling me, he was still confused about it. He had gone with a, a group of students, I guess they're from the Bible school, to pray for a woman who was dying of terminal cancer. And they gathered around her bed and prayed, and he said, man, I, we, the, I felt the presence of God. And uh, he said, I really felt I, I had a word from God, and said, I prophesied to the woman that she would not die, that God was healing her and raising her up. But a few days later, she died. And he was wondering, what, man, what happened? How could that be? How could I, how could I be so mistaken? 
And did she do something wrong? Did she miss God, you know? Here's what, you know, here's what, I'm satisfied with what happened. I believe this. Amel, he felt compassion for this woman. She's lying there dying. He believes in divine healing. And oh, how he wanted to see a miracle of healing. And he had all of these feelings in the realm of his soul. And he mistook those feelings, those natural feelings. My, my, my friends, when you see somebody suffering, even in your soul, you will feel compassion. You will feel concern. Most people will. And I am, I am sure that Amel, he felt compassion from his soul. His emotions were stirred, and he believed in divine healing. And he was in a Bible school that was emphasizing divine healing and gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so he stepped out and he prophesied. But then it didn't happen. She died. How could this be? Again, he wasn't a false prophet. He was a sincere person who had never learned to distinguish between the soul and the spirit. All oh, today, how we need to learn to distinguish between the soul and the spirit. Because you see, it, it's, it, it's, you can refine the soul. You can develop the soul and you can, can create a very attractive person in the soul realm. And you can attract people to you in the realm of the soul. Leaders have done this. You can attract people with great oratory throughout history. People like Adolf Hitler, to name one, and others, great orators have moved the masses, moved their souls. I remember sitting in a, a restaurant and, uh, you know, they had music playing and it was that there was some old song country song of some sort but it was some that was very familiar when I was a kid growing up and it, it brought back nostalgic memories and it stirred my emotions and even brought tears to my eyes had nothing to do with God <laughs> it was it was stirring an area of my soul realm of my emotions and so on and we have to learn to distinguish between the spirit and the soul. And sad to say, preachers, too many have learned how to stir people's souls. I, I, I'll never forget one of the, my earliest experiences this. Before I went to Bible school, and man, I, I was on fire. I was hungry to know all about God. And I came across a church, and I'd been to it before. I'd visited it before in Paris, Texas. And Charles and Delilah were on in Paris, Texas. They remember this. And uh, I believe the pastor's name was Garton Hire. He was a good person. And uh, he, he really believed and, and, and valued the power of God, gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know how well he knew this evangelist, but he had this, this, this evangelist there who considered himself a prophet. And I remember driving by, this is back in the early 1970s, probably 71, 72, had a great big banner stretched out across the churchyard that had this person's name and in big letters, God's 20th century prophet. Now that should have, that, that should have, <laughs> that should have been a big flashing red light. But because I was young in the faith, because, because that's so ego-centered. Why should it be a flashing red light? It is so ego-centered. God's 20th century prophet. Give me a break. What did Jesus say? He said, don't call yourself by this title or that title or that title. He said, because you're all brothers and sisters, you're all on the same level. Well, anyway, so I went to some of the meetings and, <laughs> and he, was, he was calling people. 40, 46 years I've known you and I've never heard this story. This is amazing. Really? really? It, it's in my, you must not have read my Revival Fire book. It's in there. <laughs> well, 
Well, no, you must have too because you, you would have formatted it for me, so you must have. You, <laughs> you've forgotten it. Well, anyway, uh, he, he, you know, he would call, this small church, he'd call people out and prophesy to them, and his prophecies were all in, you know, all kinds of symbolism and so on. And, you, you, know, you, know, you know, like, um, you know, so, somebody had a ball of, he saw somebody with a ball of chain on their leg, and a, a white dove came down and pecked them on the top of the head in the chamber. Now, he didn't exactly say that, but it was this sort of thing, you know. <laughs> And he, you know, he called me out and gave me a prophecy. I couldn't make heads or tails out of it. <laughs> but this was God's 20th century prophet. <laughs> but he was functioning in the soul. He, he had learned how to function in the soul realm in a way that was very attractive to a lot of people. And I remember people, you know, getting very emotional and crying and jumping and shouting and everything, you know. <laughs> but then I came there one day and... Uh, the meeting had, had been shut down. And I discovered the pastor closed it down because God's 20th century prophet prophesied to some people that he, he got to know in the church, found out that they were people that had some money, and he prof prophesied to them that they were to give him money and land. Oh, my friends. Oh, how we need to learn to distinguish between the soul and the spirit. There are so many well-meaning people today. Man, I, I read so many, pro you know, I, I'll just say this. I heard and read prophecies, people even who are well-known, giving prophecies about the coronavirus pandemic. And back in March, I heard people, some very well-known people saying that God had shown them it was going to end at Easter, some said it was going to end. One person, you know, they had a vision. It was going to end April 30th, at the end of the April. All sorts of things going on. And there is so much, my friends, there's so much of things that happen in the realm of the soul. I call them soulish prophecies. They originate with people's emotions and imaginations not from the Spirit of God. And oh, how we need to be aware of this. And, and as we are aware of this, now let me give you an example, another example. I remember back in the 1990s, Sue and I went to a place, that it, was, it was very well known all over the world, and there was a, a, a revival taking place there. It was actually in Toronto. We went there. And there was a lot of stuff going on. People falling on the floor, people laughing hilariously, and things going on. And I came away deeply refreshed in my soul. It, there, there was an obvious, even though there are things that went on there that I wouldn't agree with, there was obviously, because hey, we're human, my friends. If you're waiting for a perfect revival to come, you'll never have one. Because God works through frail human vessels. Our friend Bill Kaiser says God would like to use perfect people, but he can't find any. <laughs> so he has to use those who are available, who seek him and are available. But I remember coming away from there feeling deeply refreshed by the presence of God. Not too long after that, I was, I was invited to come to another revival meeting. And I went there and a lot of the, the same things were happening. I was so deeply grieved. Didn't, I didn't see anything different from what I'd seen in the other one. Same things happening, but my spirit was so deeply grieved. I can't tell you how much. And I remember leaving there, and I love the move of the Holy Spirit. I pray for the reign of God's Holy Spirit to visit us once again. But I left that meeting, that revival meetings, and, and, and the thought inside, if this is revival, I don't want anything to do with it. And it wasn't because of anything outward. But you know what I believe the reason was I was so grieved? was because this is something, and I heard uh, you know, some of the talk there that some of the people in this church, they had gone and visited some well-known revival somewhere. And apparently what happened was they came back and decided they were going to have. <laughs> 
And it was, it was a revival that was worked up. Worked up out of the soul realm. There's a, there, there, there's, I'm looking here, there's a, a quote I want to read to you in relation to this. Quote from R.A. Torrey, whom God used powerfully in revivals. Just bear with me a minute. This is, this is worth waiting on. This is so powerful. He's talking about... He wrote this in the early... And again, R.A. Torrey had very, some very powerful revivals in America, in Australia, in different countries. But he wrote this and he was talking about what we're talking about right now. He said the most fundamental trouble with most of our present day so-called revivals is that they are man-made and not God-sent. They're man-made. They come out of the, the human soul. They are worked up. And he, he, he's the one who said all of this I'm saying. They are worked up, I almost said faked up, by man's cunningly devised machinery, not prayed down. My friends, never be intimidated by people's soul rim. I have seen people try to use prophecy to manipulate and control other people. Like this fellow I was telling you about who tried to get people to give him money and land. And I'll, I'll close this with one more example. But one of the most, but you know, one way to, to recognize soul rim ministry is it will be so self-centered, it always comes back to the self. Because you see, the soul is, is the place of the ego. It is the place of the I. It's where we have self-awareness. And this was before I ever, I think before I met Sue, I think maybe I had enrolled in Bible school, but a friend of our family's who pastored in Oklahoma invited me to come and preach. And I went there to preach, and I remember on a Sunday night, it was a Pentecostal church, and they believed in the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit and so on. I preached, and I gave an invitation. A lot of the people came forward, and there was a time of prayer, and then people went back, and they sat down in their seats, and I turned it over to the pastor. And um, everybody was sitting there like everybody's ready to go home, except one woman and her two teenage daughters. And uh, uh, these two teenage girls, God bless them. But they were, they, were, they were in the aisles and uh, they, they were walking forward and backward with their eyes closed and they were going like this. Ah, 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 and they were walking forwards and backwards. And their mother was sitting on the front seat and she was kind of shouting and so on. Nobody else was sensing anything. Everybody else was just kind of sitting there. <laughs> ready to go home. And all of a sudden, the mother breaks forth in a prophecy. And she said, Thus saith the Lord, get in the spirit like you see these others are doing. <laughs> and even though I was very new in the things of God, I knew that prophecy was not from God because it was calling attention to themselves. My friends, what did Jesus say when the Holy Spirit is come? He will glorify me. For he will take the things that are mine and he will show them the things that are of me. He will show them to you. And he will glorify me. And in Revelation, is it chapter 19? Verse 10 maybe? says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All my friends, be aware of this as you're moving around in the world today. Let's renew our own souls. Let's continue working on ourselves, renewing our minds in God's word. And as our 
soul is renewed in God's Word and becomes more, it becomes more aligned with the Holy Spirit. Then the Holy Spirit is, is more free and can flow through us more clearly and freely. And, and the things we share will be more pure from the Spirit of God. Whether we say, thus saith the Lord, or not, our words and our speech will be more pure because our own mind has been renewed and is now more aligned to the newborn spirit and the Holy Spirit that is in us. Lord, thank you today for the new birth. Thank you, God, for our new spirit. And thank you for giving us your wonderful Holy Spirit to come and to dwell in us. And Lord, we thank you tonight that we don't have to be afraid of death. We don't have to be intimidated by anything or anybody. Because we know, Lord, that when we die, as Paul said, it's far better than anything we've experienced on this earth. It will be far better. And so, Lord, we thank you for that revelation of our eternal existence with you.